Okay, welcome back. Fourth of July week. Hope you're making plans for the weekend. And even more than that, I hope they work out for you. You never know. Best laid plans of mice and those others sometimes don't work. Here with us is a man who always has a plan. He is Webster Griffin Tarpley, our greatest living historian. And I'm always honored to have Webster on the program as a friend. But more than that, as a great resource for all of you to help understand, even if you don't agree, to get a better slant on things. Remember, the the game here is to think. Even if you disagree, the game is to engage in the process. Welcome back, Mr. T. Thank you very much, Jeff. How are you? I'm uh, well, thank you. As uh, all things considered can be uh, distilled, I guess that's the best way I can phrase it. <laughs> well, um it, which it is now the middle point of the year, and um, God, is it ever? Did it, uh, would it last about three of, three months, and it's here. <laughs> uh, big events, and um, maybe we can treat some of them. However, before we continue, I would like to talk mainly about domestic U.S. tonight for a change. But right. before we do, we have to we have to mark this uh, hundred years since the beginning of World War One, or in particular since the. Sarajevo assassinations of uh, the Archduke and the uh, and his wife, which happened and one year after the uh, U.S. Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act. Interestingly enough, yes, uh, I don't know what in particular to make of that. Except the one, well, the one thing you can make of it is that the the, the events leading up to World War II bear the the imprint of uh, Freemasonic lodges. Uh, a, a, tremendous campaign mm -hmm. by British centered Freemasonic lodges and some French ones, but it's the, the so-called Grand Orient or Grand Orient, uh -huh. uh, which was the center of French, uh, the, the sort of uh, Anglophile French Freemasons. And then on the, on the British side, we had the, uh, naturally the York Rite and the Scottish Rite, but we also had these special ones like the Quatuor Coronati Lodge, the four crowned heads, who were two two people from from ancient his uh, four people from ancient history, and this was headed up or, or dominated by King Edward the Seventh. So mm -hmm. the the leader of this Freemasonic coalition, which gripped the world for for decades in the mm -hmm. in the latter part of the nineteenth century, was King Edward the Seventh of Britain, and it was of course the British policy to deal with the German challenge by resorting to war, that they they felt that they couldn't match Germany in terms of industry and progress and production. So they no, the they Germans were, were leading it with the dust, you're right. Agreed. Yeah. And the U.S. leaving uh, all of Europe in the dust, really. But uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the case of Germany, they felt this was a, a military threat. So uh, the answer to this was a policy of encirclement. And this was pioneered by King Edward VII, who actually mm -hmm. conducted a personal diplomacy. The, the, the mechanism that, that went into motion in, uh, in late July of 1914 was this Entente, the Triple Entente of England, France, and Russia. That had been personally assembled by uh, King Edward VII, who had died mm -hmm. a couple of years before. But his, uh, uh, his protégés, like Sir Edward Grey, the foreign minister, or Sir Jackie Fisher, the head of the Royal Navy, and, and many, many others. Sir Winston Churchill. Sir Winston Churchill's first job in government was to write a daily summary of what was going on in Parliament and send that to King Edward VII. So and, and report this, back this to is Bernard, a shadow of evil. And report back to Bernard Baruch as well, uh, who bought him at least yeah, twice. But Bernard, look, we're, talking, we're talking apples and oranges. Bernard, Bar You need a microscope to see Bernard Baruch compared you, to oh, I the agree. emperor of the world, King do Edward you, VII, right? you know, emperor of India. I have I have not heard Webster anyone even utter the term triple entente in uh, thirty years. <laughs> well, this is this is what went this is what what made World War One possible I know. because without right. it you couldn't you couldn't get the war. It's fascinating. In particular, the the insight was that you, without Russia you couldn't have a European war. And the uh, great uh, mm -hmm. the great wisdom of Bismarck was to say we're going to have this so-called reinsurance treaty between Germany and Russia, which essentially said that there would be no war between Germany and Russia, mm -hmm. no matter what either country might do, whatever wars Russia might be in, whatever wars Germany might be in, they would never line up one against the other. And that, of course, was thrown overboard by the 
unstable, erratic, uh, neurotic to psychotic uh, 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 Emperor William II. But here, the, the thing that I wanted to just throw out here, we, maybe we talk about this as, as, the, as these anniversaries go, go forward now, because yeah. we'll be living through World War I anniversaries uh-huh. for the next five years, right? Yeah. And Versailles anniversaries and all those anniversaries. People. Uh, yes, well, a lot of history, the, the weight of the uh, past generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. But here we go. Uh, this is a little story about a guy called Clarence Henry Norman. Now, this is not Sir Montague Norman of the Bank of England. This is Clarence Henry Norman of the Independent Labor Party, which was a sort of a maverick political formation. They were against the war in World War One, and they also they asserted their independence from the... Uh, from the Labour Party in a number of ways, hence the name. So these were, uh, uh, you know, unpredictable uh, people, but they were they, they wanted to be guided by principle. So here we have this guy, Clarence Henry Norman, and we have to remember that the time frame we're talking about goes from June 28, 1914, that's the assassination in Sarajevo, to July 28, mm-hmm. 1914. That's mm-hmm. where we get the... Uh, first declarations of war between well, uh, Austria and uh, and Serbia. Right Although the British, it. the British also mobilized their fleet. Bef- the British are the first to mobilize before anybody. If you count mobilizing the fleet, which in mm-hmm. their case is what counts most. So here's uh, Clarence Henry Norman says he walks. He's, he's, it's a, a Sunday in um, in England, I think, and he he says he's walking down the the Strand in central. London, and he meets uh, some influential people. He meets a guy who is uh, a, a top uh, uh, liberal activist of the Liberal Party, and the guy asks him, "Have you heard any news from Sarajevo? Have you heard the news from any news from Sarajevo?" And he's surprised, and he says, "I don't. What, where, what's Sarajevo? I've never heard of Sarajevo. Where is it? What is it?" And it turns out this, of course, is this, this town in. Uh, in Bosnia, and then this, this this liberal guy that he's talking to, very distraught, goes off saying, is it possible that they screwed up? Is it possible that they blew it? So he rushes off in, in huh. complete uh, disarray. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the news doesn't come until later. Right? It comes in, in the afternoon mm. that the two uh, successors to the, the Vienna, the throne of Vienna and, and of Budapest have been, uh, have been killed by this guy, Prinkip. And then Later in the afternoon, the same guy, Norman, goes to a, uh, a salon, a rich uh, a person's uh, home where they're going to have tea, mm-hmm. and this is somebody connected to the Northcliffe uh, newspapers and other uh, important British newspapers, and the hostess who's uh, serving the tea, uh, and there are some top-level uh, British uh, newspaper people and other influentials there, and the uh, the hostess says, "But you know, by the way, this of course is the signal for the great European war that we've been uh, we've been talking about for so long, right? This is now this is it. This is uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon. Now that's a very remarkable statement because the quality of July 1914, and we're now in July uh, 2014." The, the the agreement of most contemporary observers is that there's a dreamlike quality of unreality and the inability to grasp that something horrendous is about to occur. There is a new book about this called The Sleepwalkers. And I don't agree with much in this book, but this, the idea of calling it The Sleepwalkers, I think at least captures this as far as the average person is concerned. Most of Europe were indeed people sleepwalking into a world catastrophe. Now, at the higher level, of course, when, they get, when we get to Sir Edward Gray and, and Sir Jackie Fisher and some others, you'll see that this is not this, the case. They want is, war and they're going to yeah, get war. Yeah. This is not, you're not saying denial, you're saying people who are sleepwalking or oblivious. That the exactly. average schmo doesn't know what's yeah. happening and often uh, lapses into a mood of, of Pollyanna-ish uh, illusion. Hey, weird. Keep going. We're going to keep going. Go ahead. So that may be my question at, at some of these strategic forums, right, at the U.S.-Russia forum in the, uh, in the Hart Senate building. I asked uh, 
Ambassador Jack Matlock, who had been the U.S. ambassador to Moscow under Reagan, mm-hmm. and on the whole, not not the worst guy among the State Department veterans. Um, are we in July 1914? He said he didn't think we were, but we may well be. That is, with you, when you look at this um, this stuff in uh, in Ukraine. Let me just just point out about that. One one of the speakers was uh, Stephen Cohen, the professor of Soviet studies, married to Katrina Vanden Heuvel of the nation. This, the nation has actually tried to, to do some kind of constructive work in calling attention to this danger. Right? But Cohen's opinion is that, uh, well, it, it, you can also verify it, that, that there's tremendous pressure on Putin to declare a no-fly zone in Ukraine and suppress the, the, um, the bombing of civilians by the Ukrainian uh, Air Force and and by, especially by the right sector, right? So the, they, they do that on the ground, right? They're they're they're. Well, they supposedly they only have one small battalion of official right sector people. There's a lot of mercenaries involved. Hundreds allegedly killed today, as opposed to only five Ukrainian dead. But you can't believe those statistics, as we know. I, I the yeah, game. We the, know the, the, game. the Ukrainian um, forces were characterized by you know refusal to to engage and then ineptitude. So I. I can't get into it at that detail, right? But I just I would just point to the fact that this is extremely dangerous. The other point that uh, that Cohen wanted to go into was the danger of tactical nuclear warfare in the in the Ukrainian situation. Now, I, that's this is essentially what I've been saying for ten years since the color revolution, the orange revolution of uh, November two thousand four. I've tried to point out that this is the most dangerous place in the world because it's really the only place where two nuclear armed forces could collide that is the russian forces who have lots of nuclear weapons and nato forces polish typically polish nato troops coming in that would expect to be given the u.s uh, nuclear umbrella so that's mm-hmm. uh that's what you have going on so anyway mm-hmm. these books let me just remind you now the guy's name is clarence henry norman and one of his books is called a searchlight on the european war mm. And he, this, these books were suppressed by the British during World War One. Anything he wrote was suppressed. He was harassed. He was uh, he was uh, put away for a while by Lord Cave. How about Lo- Lord Cave was the Home Secretary? So they actually Lord put Cave him away. Would send you, yeah. huh? They actually put him away. They <laughs> put him away for a while. Sure, the Brit- <laughs> they have these, you know, what are they called? The uh, Q notices or whatever they are. D. They they simply say this this article cannot appear. It's He's a D got notice. another book called some yeah D notice. There we go. Some secret influences behind the European war. So um, the the point about all this is, as we go now through the coming months, there's going to be a lot of blathering by pseudo-historians who are going to try to tell you, and indeed th- this has already started, right, that the, of course, Germany is responsible, and the, the war guilt clause of Versailles, whatever else we want to say about it, it does not hold up. It is not uh, tenable uh, concerning Germany having the sole guilt for World War I. I would say much more accurate would be to say the Freemasonic networks of King Edward VII of Great Britain and this includes the British government of that point. It includes people like uh, like Poincaré in France, Clemenceau in France. It includes Théophile Delcassé, another top uh, French diplomat, the Cambon brothers, C-A-M-B-O-N. But it also includes Izvolsky and Sazonov on the Russian side. And it includes... Um, any number of other people, right? Um, and I, I would also point to another another guilty party is Count Berchtold of the uh, of the Austrian government, who mm-hmm. who seems to he, the difference is that Berchtold wanted a regional war; he wanted Austria to crush Serbia. But the people in Britain and France and you know, the same people in Russia, in other words, this this British-centered Freemasonic network that reached across. The world they wanted an all-out continental and world war, not just a regional war. And in the middle of all this, you have the pathetic Kaiser, right? The pathetic Emperor of Germany, who is simply he's he's incapable of comprehending. He's simply do, do we, too too weak mentally. Right? Do, do we see international banking involved in this? Uh, and if so, how? Yeah, of course, of course. 
I mean, what, what have I just said, right? It, it, international, British centered Freemasonic networks with King Edward the Seventh, and the, the banks are simply, you know, they're they're one, the assets of this. Uh, this, this uh, I wonder who's an asset of whom, but uh, point well taken. Well, for King Edward the Seventh, it was very clear when he gave he would give his uh, he had a certain amount of assets, right? He would give this to bankers, uh-huh. and he'd say, "All right, fine. If you manage my assets, you're, you'll be admitted at the court." And they all wanted to be at the court. But then he said, "By the way, if there are losses, you will eat the losses. If there are profits, I will collect <laughs> the profit." That was the deal, yeah. and that's all these. That's Rothschild Castle. Uh, all of them, every well, one of uh, them, had to accept that deal. Heads I win, tails you lose. That's right. Uh, so. that's, that's where it came from. Uh, Clemenceau, I haven't heard about for years, the tiger. Yeah, he another character. These were, a whole these bunch of were them. British uh, assets. These were people who were you know, variously obsessed with Germany or uh, Alsace-Lorraine or whatever. Mm-hmm. Naturally, nobody with any brains ever considered war over the actual issue of Alsace-Lorraine. Mm-hmm. But for the British, this again, the, the British line concerning Germany was there are no conflicts of interest. There's only a general rivalry uh, for world domination. So that was that mm-hmm. was what it was. And uh, I mean, you can find all kinds of uh, literature about the um, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, and that is to say, he his his idea was Franz Ferdinand wanted to take the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary, and he wanted to make it into a triple monarchy by allowing the creation of a South Slav kingdom, in other words, what would have been Yugoslavia, with equal rights with the others. Sure. And this, of course, was blocked by the Hungarians, by the mm-hmm. Magyars, because mm-hmm. they would have been the ones out of whose territory that would have been carved. Mm-hmm. But Franz Ferdinand had married a Czech countess, a Czech woman, so he was taking position for the South Slavs, and he wanted to reduce the power of the Magyars, who were very oppressive, very backward landowners over huge areas that were inhabited by Slovenes and Romanians and all sorts of others. And the the Magyars, of course, were a a minority in their own country, so they had to be very, very oppressive. So he wanted to have, instead of dualism, he wanted to have what's known as trialism. Now, whether that would have uh, ever amounted to anything is anybody's guess, but the idea was that he was some kind of a reformer. And you have to also remember that the assassinations, it's not just one assassination, it's quite a few. And of these others, there's an attempt to kill Rasputin already in the summer of 1914. The the actual assassination of Rasputin is in December of 1916 by... Prince Yusupov, right? He was tough is, as nails, Rasputin. Prince Yusupov is a homosexual lover of King Edward VII personally. Okay? Wonderful. <laughs> and this Yusupov was one of the richest people in Russia and leads us in all sorts of interesting directions. Good but Lord. the idea was oh, God. the What's British it? were convinced the British were convinced mm-hmm. that Rasputin was an agent of the central powers mm-hmm. and he was pro German and there was something to this, although of course he was also a, a monster. So there was an attempt to kill him, and the other assassination, which I would I would point to, uh-huh. is the assassination of Jean Jaurès, J A U R E S, right. with a little accent on the uh, the the latter E. Mm-hmm. And this was a French socialist. Uh, you remember the the Socialist International had pledged that if a war broke out, the socialist parties would all vote no money for the war. And Jaurès was somebody who said, "That's what we're going to do." Mm-hmm. We're going to say, down with the war, down with the ruling mm-hmm. class, not one penny, not one man no for this bloodbath. For and he was assassinated yeah. in the street. That'll so this you. was the the power of this Freemasonic uh, combination. 